Fantastic. Right. Okay, okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate you coming along, giving us a little bit of your time. Uh, we are joined by Jerry Buting tonight, who's really kindly uh, called in from the States to, to come and join us. Um, he's been a criminal defence solicitor for about 35 years now, and since 1993, his practice has focused on uh, severe criminal cases and charges. Um, he's a frequently sourced, sourced lecturer um, on topics like forensic science, computer crime, um, and general expert testimony in a, in a courtroom setting. And some of you might well be joining because you've seen him in the Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer, where he was representing the defence in the State v Avery case. Um, his talk tonight is Where's the Science in Forensic Science? And I believe if there's nothing else you need from me, Jerry, I'll happily sit back and enjoy. All right. Thank, Thank you so you much. John. Thank you, John, and thanks to the Society for inviting me. I'm really excited to be able to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is forensic science. It's been sort of a niche practice of mine throughout my career. And in fact, going all the way back to my undergraduate days and Indiana University, I got a degree in uh, forensic studies. So um, we're going to talk about the state of forensic science evidence in the courts today. Um, and but if 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 any of you watched Making a Murderer, um, I was the co-counsel of Stephen for Stephen Avery along with my friend Dean Strang, and there was substantial forensic science evidence and lack of evidence in that case. Um, and people who watch that often ask me, is that the craziest case you've ever had? It's gotta be, right? And yeah, it was a strange case, but sadly not that unusual. Uh, and from my own practice, it was not any, not one bit crazier than the case of Ralph Armstrong, which uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about today, that was a post-conviction case that I handled for the Innocence Project. And there was important forensic evidence there. And I'm going to use both of them to kind of illustrate um, some of the issues that I think we should all be aware of. Um, let me give you a quick synopsis of the Ralph Armstrong case. Uh, it was, an, as I said, it was a post-conviction. It was an old case, June of 1980. A co-ed was found murdered in her apartment. Uh, she had been raped. She was naked, face down on the bed. And um, draped across her back was a pink terry cloth bathrobe belt that had been removed from the bathrobe itself, which was found crumpled on the bed, on the floor next to the bed. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about what some of the, the evidence, the forensic evidence that was used or that ultimately became very important. Um, there was a single eyewitness who was sitting on his porch uh, in the middle of the night, uh, saw an individual coming in and out of the victim's apartment building, uh, but they were, could not make an, uh, an identification from um, talking with the police. So the police, hypnotized this witness and it was recorded. Um, and you can thank, thankfully it's recorded because you can see they're, they're improperly suggesting that the witness change the description of the suspect originally uh, they had given, which was about six inches shorter than my client. Uh, and so when somebody's hypnotized, they're, they're very vulnerable to suggestion. And and so this was recorded and this was going on. Um, they did a lineup. And despite the fact that it was 1980 in Madison, Wisconsin, they supposedly had a hard time finding people with long hair uh, to match the description of the suspect and also my client. And so I'm going to show you this actual lineup video uh, picture that they used. And I don't know if you can see, but these are all cops and they couldn't find cops with long hair. So this is a, they put a fake wig on two of them. That's, that's ridiculously obvious. It's laughable if it wasn't for the fact that this was used in a criminal case. Um, there was then also forensic evidence that we're gonna talk, to, talk about as we, we get, uh, go forward because really it was the, forensic evidence that was offered as being objective and reliable 
that I think the jury was able to um, rely upon and ultimately convicting my client, Ralph Armstrong, who's um, sort of slumped down there at, under the advice of his attorney, who said that this lineup was so bogus that you really shouldn't even participate in it. So that's why he's in that position. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to go through sort of a brief history of first uh, can, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, a brief history of forensic science. Uh, to talk a little bit about why it fails to provide real justice in so many cases. Instead, what I call just the illusion of justice, which is also the name of a book I wrote. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about efforts to reform the science in the courts, including um, there in the UK. Um, Uh, all these meal kits. All right. Um, I want to make sure people can. I'll just put that. Can we make sure we're all muted? Sorry about that. Thank you. That'd be great. All right. So um, let's talk about you know what is forensic science. You know how did it originate? Um, <coughs> you know what's the? How did it come to be used so commonly? Um, See, there's some people in the waiting room. Okay. Um, so, forensic science uh, actually, some parts of forensic science started in the UK. Uh, the guy who's known as sort of the, the father of forensic pathology, Sir Bernard Spilsbury in England. Um, in the 1910s and 20s, um, developed a lot of techniques that became standard in the use of uh, forensic autopsies. Uh, in fact, if, uh, if you're ever in Nottingham, the, the, I think it's called the National Crime Museum or, or Justice Museum, has a real interesting exhibit about him, um, which I w went to when I spoke in Nottingham. I, I, uh, I like to go to courts and museums whenever I travel. So anyway, the first real crime labs though were set up by J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI in the 1930s. And um, most of the forensic science disciplines in use today did not originate in the scientific, say academic field, DNA being the one, uh, one of a couple of exceptions, but generally they were created specifically for use by law enforcement in criminal cases. Um, and as a result, they unfortunately skipped the scientific validation process that, that is um, typically required in, in the use of any other kind of science. Um, and that scientific um, not sure I'm letting all these people in that are still waiting, but um, the, the scientific method is, uh, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but basically it's observations. Uh, a scientist will observe something, formulate a hypothesis about um, whether uh, this or that might be true. They, they then do a number of experiments to test some deductions, collect data. They then might refine or completely eliminate the original hypothesis. And then very importantly, um, whatever findings they come up with are subject to peer review um, so that others can try to replicate them and crucially determine what the error rates are because no scientific test or protocol is 100% accurate. Unfortunately, nearly all forensic disciplines fail that, um, fail to do that. So the idea that Hoover and others in the 1930s came up with was too many trials it seemed were being decided based on sort of he said, she said, um, uh, unreliable lay human witness testimony and that if in fact they could standardize and come up with what appeared to be objective evidence, it would make it easier for the prosecution to get convictions. And so um, the thereby you know, removing the uncertainties that, that often led to reasonable doubt. Um, and they also knew that, that 
most people, lay people, wouldn't have the same kind of expertise. Um, so uh, an expert could come in, to, uh, have sort of the lab coat uh, phenomenon that uh, jurors would tend to defer to the opinions that the uh, experts would present. And so the, the primary question then that was designed, forensics science was designed to answer is, did the crime scene evidence or the evidence from the body come from the suspect or the defendant if he's now been charged? And these are just a, a few of some of the earliest kinds of forensic science that was used, that is microscopic hair comparison. Um, they find a hair at the scene or maybe on the body and they have a suspect and they, they pluck a hair from the suspect and they put it under a double dual field microscope and they look at it microscopically and the analyst then testifies um, and an, uh, is supposed to give an opinion about whether the hair might be similar to or consistent with, um, but the science was never good enough that they should could have or should have said that it was a match. Although unfortunately it was misused that way all too often. Tool marks and ballistics, um, you know, whether a bullet came from a gun, fingerprints of course, handwriting, and then footwear and tire marks. So the problems that most of these disciplines had then and most of them still have today is that there are lots of untested assumptions. So most of them had no databases. It's not like finger, fingerprints, one exception. Uh, DNA, of course, has a database and you can de determine the frequency in the population of one particular profile or another. Uh, but there were no databases for bullets or um, handwriting exemplars or tire marks. And yet the experts would come into court and, and present their opinions and, the, and express them in terms of probabilities, like, you know, this bullet came from this gun and no other gun in the world. And, and then they would um, dress up their opinions with this term called the, to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, which by the way is now um, uh, barred from use by um, American, uh, well, not all American courts, but some American courts and the FBI and the Justice Department has instructed their analysts to no longer use that phrase because it, what does it mean? A reasonable degree of scientific certainty, what is that? It, it implies maybe that there is some scientific certainty when it's really not. Um, but most importantly, none of these had any kind of error rates. Uh, that is, they, they were uh, never tested and determined how often you would get a false positive or a false negative. So despite these flaws, these forensic disciplines basically were unchallenged for decades. And then as, the D, as DNA started to be used and exoneration started happening, the first cracks in the armor of some of these disciplines uh, became evident. And when people then go back and look at the uh, proven wrongful convictions or what you would call miscarriage of justice in the UK, uh, as many of, as 50% of them had flawed or, or wrong forensic evidence. That is to say, uh, forensic evidence that, that pointed to them or was maybe misused and experts actually said that it was a match with the defendant when in fact DNA later proved that was completely wrong. And these of course, um, I shouldn't say of course, but these are one of the ones that, that were most commonly uh, coming up in the DNA exonerations, this hair comparison that we talked about, footwear, um, arson cases, and bite marks. And we're going to talk about bite marks more um, in, in just a little bit. So despite the fact that, that hundreds of DNA exonerations happened, there was really no concerns transferred to the criminal justice system about the overall reliability of these pattern matching disciplines. And then something happened, uh, you're all probably too young to remember, but in 2004, there was a terrible uh, terrorist bombing of a train in Madrid. 191 people killed, 2,000 or more injured. Just, it was an unbelievable tragedy. And a fingerprint was found on a plastic bag at the scene and the Spanish police sent it off uh, 
uh, through Interpol or whatever um, around the world, and, and especially to US, Britain, and France. And the FBI declared a match of an individual by the name of Brandon Mayfield. Now, Mr. Mayfield was an American lawyer based in Portland, Oregon. His fingerprints were on file in the FBI's database only because he'd had nine years of service in the US military. But he was a Muslim convert. And there was suspicion that that therefore made him a potential terrorist. So he's arrested. He's jailed for two weeks until the Spanish authorities on their own disagreed with the FBI. And they instead found a print that matched an Algerian national who was in fact a known terrorist. And um, so it was concluded that despite the FBI's match of this fingerprint that supposedly is, we've all learned is unique, right? Uh, what went wrong? And so it really caused a stir and an international study began and uh, tried to figure out what went wrong. And ultimately it was decided that what's known as confirmation bias was the leading cause. Confirmation bias is, a, is a, just a human um, element that uh, we all have. It's a tendency to, um, it's sort of, we, it's also called tunnel vision sometimes. Uh, it's an inclination to just sort of see what we think we should see and ignore the other evidence. And sometimes that bias occurs when analysts in forensic cases are uh, considering extraneous information from law enforcement when they really shouldn't be. And so in this instance, the, it wasn't just that the fingerprint of the uh, suspect found at the crime scene was, was declared a match with Mr. Mayfield's, but other, and other information perhaps including the knowledge that he was a, a converted Muslim might have impacted unconsciously and biased the examiner. All right, so as a result of this big sort of scandal, uh, in 2005, the US Congress commissioned this study of all forensic science disciplines by the National Academy of Science. And in 2009, they released a report called Strengthening Forensic Science in the United States, a path forward. And the results really shocked the public and the forensic community. They concluded that DNA was the only forensic discipline that had ever been scientifically validated. Not fingerprints, ballistics, hair comparison, none of it. And they came up with 13 recommendations to improve the system, some of which were um, all of these disciplines were sort of in their own silos, uh, you know, like the American Association of Toolmark Examiners and the American Association of Fingerprint Analysts. And, and they recommended that each one of these associations go back and uh, subject their protocols to valid, you know, to scientific validation, determine the error rates and um, strengthen their reliability if, if possible. They also included recommending um, a National Institute of Forensic Science, which unfortunately Congress never, um, never created. And they, uh, the UK on the other hand did. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Other NAS recommendations were that, again, I mentioned scientific validation studies being done um, but also they recommended the crime labs be independent of law enforcement, that it was, uh, again, would affect even unconsciously the bias of the analysts if they knew that law enforcement or prosecutors' uh, theory about what happened and who might be the guilty subject um, was being presented to them. And if they didn't produce the results that were expected, these are the same people that are going to be doing their performance evaluations, merit raises, all of that later on. And um, so they recommended separating crime labs and making them independent entities. Uh, they also recommended cross-discipline education um, at academic institutions, um, specifically in forensic science, and that and continuing legal education for lawyers. And 
And that to this day is a, a real flaw in the way we, we train our lawyers. Uh, it's always struck me as surprising that, that, that uh, you, you may spend a semester or a year uh, studying evidence and the rules of evidence and how, how and when evidence can and can't be used and what its limitations are. But very little of the training really involves forensic science, even though it's becoming more and more prevalent. In fact, it's very hard to find a case these days that doesn't have some degree of forensic. So that was one of the recommendations. Now, in the UK in 2008, um, this position called forensic science regulator was created. And the idea was similar to the National Institute of Forensic Science that was proposed in the NAS. And um, it was to try and standardize the practice, improve the quality of the various disciplines, um, assist with privatizing forensics. There was a number of, of private and therefore independent agencies in, in, in the UK at that time. Um, and unfortunately, there are not so many today. Um, but the real problem was that there was no regulatory enforcement power. So even if if uh, they, the FSR recommended that uh, this lab or this analyst become accredited and go through um, proficiency testing annually, uh, if they didn't, there was nothing really they, they could do. They couldn't be excluded from use in the courts. Um, and that finally has, has changed with an act that was uh, in two, 2021, um, but it's too early to know whether that will really make a difference and whether the powers are strong enough to really uh, improve the, the state of forensic science in the UK. Now, there was also a report by the House of Lords um, a year or so ago on the state of, of forensics in the UK and um, really pointing out that the bill is coming due, that there is a, a chronic shortage of resources, financial resources, devoted to forensics, um, as there are, frankly, in the entire court system. And this is not unique to the UK. The, the US has the same problem. Courts are starved of money. Prosecutors don't have enough resources. The defense certainly does. They never have. Um, and, and so this uh, latest report warns that forensics is falling under the same um, deficits that the rest of the justice system is, and there will soon be a breaking point. Uh, innocent people being convicted and, and guilty people going free because of uh, inadequate forensic science attention. All right, so <clears throat> despite the NAS report, there, there was really little progress for years, uh, especially in the courts. And one of the reasons for that is because there's this inherent conflict between the law, which relies on precedent, and science, which is continuously improving, evolving. And um, uh, you know, some case 40 years ago may have concluded that bite mark evidence is, is valid and reliable and therefore should be admissible in court when uh, nowadays most scientists completely disagree with that. But when you uh, try to exclude it, the judges look at this 40 year old case and say, see, it was admissible and you know, precedent uh, uh, basically wins out. Um, another big problem is that lawyers and judges are, are poor gatekeepers who uh, most of us really lack the scientific aptitude and training that we need to be able to um, separate the wheat from the chaff and the, the junk science from the valid science that should be admissible. In 2016, then, uh, President Obama's Council of Advisors um, studied a, a select group, which is the majority probably of forensic disciplines, that is feature comparisons, where crime scene evidence is matched or looked at in comparison to a, a suspect. And what they found was, again, kind of shocking that, that all too often experts overstated the probative value of their evidence with providing jurors with opinions like they were 100% certain, that there was no error rate, um, and in essence, presenting what still might be valid evidence for a jury to consider if they understand that it's not truly objective evidence, that it's subjective and relies upon the 
qualifications, the expertise, and the credibility of a, of a particular um, expert who's testifying. The um, PCAST report looked at, at a number of disciplines, including these. And it's a quick aside, there's single source DNA and now there's very complex mixtures of DNA. DNA is uh, in the NAS report talked about it being the most scientifically valid. And it, it un unfortunately it's become less probative in many cases than it used to be. Now it seems contrary to what you might think, but here's why in, in the early um, technology of DNA analysis, it required large volumes of bodily fluids, blood, semen, whatever it might be, so that they could get a, uh, a clear sample or a profile of a suspect. And if, if uh, a person's DNA profile comes, in, comes up there, it was pretty damning evidence. It was pretty unlikely that, uh, that this person wasn't guilty of the crime unless there was some other explanation for their DNA being there. But DNA tests have become so sensitive these days that you can now get routinely a full DNA profile from just a few cells. And so what happens is when they're testing samples, there are now mixtures because it's not just the perpetrator's DNA that was potentially found um, in that evidence sample, but also extraneous DNA that was deposited in all kinds of other ways, innocent transfer DNA. Um, it's been studied uh, clearly now that if I shake your hands, uh, shake your hand, you go off, rob a bank, drop the gun you've used, my DNA might be on that gun, even though I was never even anywhere, anywhere near it. And so that's what's happened with DNA. It's, it's more sensitive, but it sometimes now is actually less probative of actual guilt or innocence. All right, then in 2016, the FBI on their own did a very interesting test. Uh, they went back retrospectively, looked at a random sampling of 268 cases that they had, their own analysts had testified in. Uh, these were the best and the brightest analysts um, for hair, microscopic hair comparison in the country. They, you know, trained at the FBI lab in Quantico. And, um, and what they found is that 95% of their own FBI experts had presented false or exaggerated opinion testimony at the trials. 34 of these cases involved the death penalty, 14 were already dead and nine had been executed. Now, that's not to say that, that the hair comparison evidence was the only evidence that, that resulted in the execution of these nine people but it, it was at least uh, presented to the jury as objective corroborative evidence of guilt. And to their credit, the FBI was so um, horrified at this that they discontinued any future microscopic hair comparison um, testimony uh, from any of their experts. But in the US, the percentage of uh, probably 90 to 95% of criminal prosecutions are not federal prosecutions for the FBI. They're individual states, 50 different states, little different rules in, in each one of them. And they, most of them are still using to this day microscopic hair comparison testimony and presenting this kind of, of um, misleading expert testimony. All right, now I'm going to play for you a video. It's, it's about nine or 10 minutes long. Uh, it was produced by Vox, and uh, the reason I've, I'm going to do this is because I think in, in this short period of time, it encapsulates so much of the concerns that, that there are about forensic science in the courtroom, how it's presented, how judges deal with it, how jurors deal with it, and it uses a real case, uh, an old case um, involving bite mark evidence from uh, Milwaukee, oddly enough, in 1985, I think it was, a wrongful conviction. <laughs> and, uh, but again, despite what you will see in this video about the, uh, the lack of any scientific foundation for this kind of evidence, bite mark evidence is still being used in courts um, throughout America and probably in the UK. So let's 
It was 1985, and Robert Lee Stinson was on trial for the murder of his neighbor. She was the 63-year-old widow found dead near the corner of 7th and Center Street. The crucial evidence in this case is bite marks found on the body of the victim. Two forensic dentists said the bite marks matched Stinson's teeth, but there were some puzzling discrepancies. They claimed Stinson's broken tooth made this mark, even though there was no mark for the adjacent full-size tooth. And when they were called to testify in court, nobody asked them about that. The bite had to be inflicted by a dentition identical to that of Mr. Stinson's. Stinson's trial was a test of whether our criminal justice system was capable of detecting unreliable forensic science. And with the future and freedom of a young man on the line, the result was an absolute system-wide failure. The U.S. has an adversarial judicial system where the judge presides over a trial but isn't responsible for uncovering the truth. Instead, it's up to the opposing lawyers to present evidence and witnesses that support their version of events. And ultimately, the theory is, of course, that through this conflict of ideas and interpretations, the truth will emerge. But from the start, Stinson could tell he wasn't entering a fair fight. He prepared a letter asking for a replacement for his lawyer who only took his case two weeks before trial. Your Honor, I'm facing life for something I did not commit, he wrote. The judge denied his request, which came in the middle of the trial, and she also denied his lawyer's motion to exclude the bite mark evidence. She said there are adequate standards and controls in the area of forensic odontology. It is a recognized area of science. Frankly, at the time, it was not a close decision for me, even though it was unique testimony. I didn't have anything in front of me that indicated that it was not reliable, and it certainly was helpful to the jury, I think, and relevant to the issues, and so I admitted the evidence. At the time, Wisconsin only required that forensic testimony be relevant and helpful to the jury. Judges weren't required to assess its reliability. You have a, an older woman who's been raped and murdered. We've got an expert who's saying we know who did it. If the judge had excluded that evidence, he would have gone free. And it would have been a legal stretch for her to do that, given the state of the law and the precedent at the time. As the appeals court would point out in a footnote, by the time of Stinson's trial, bite mark evidence had been accepted in 19 jurisdictions and rejected by none. The court in Stinson's case was no different, and the bite mark evidence went before the jury. The first thing that happens when forensic experts take the stand is that they're prompted to list their credentials to show that they're qualified. That makes sense from a certain perspective, but there's also a danger that the jury misunderstands the power of that experience. Dr. Johnson seemed to make sense to me when he testified. He certainly was qualified being a professor at the university in the federal school. Here you have this very learned dentist who has no reason to lie, um, who comes in and tells you this is rock solid science. As a jury to decide he must be wrong. That's extremely compelling. Dr. L.T. Johnson walked the jury through the evidence. He even brought models of Stinson's lower teeth and one of the bite marks so he could show how they matched. He concluded his testimony by saying that the bite marks would have to have been made by Robert Lee Stinson. The second dentist, Raymond Rawson, testified that there was no question that there was a match to a reasonable scientific certainty. Stinson's lawyer did try to get a defense expert of his own, but that expert was never called to counter the prosecution's dentist in court because after he examined the evidence, he agreed with them. Instead of two sides battling it out before the jury, there was one side with two experts making false statements about the science and one side with no experts at all. During Stinson's trial, the prosecution and defense would ask the two bite mark experts a combined 240 questions, but they didn't ask the most important one. The real question that we should be asking is what is the evidence that shows us that people in this field reach accurate results? 
it's not rocket science. Forensic scientists can have protocols and guidelines, use well-accepted tools and technology, but we won't know if their methods are actually reliable until we have what's called an error rate study. You take a bunch of bite mark examiners, give them samples of bite marks, and measure how often they make a correct identification. To this day, nobody has ever conducted a proper error rate study for bite mark analysis. And there's really no incentive to do any research because courts admit it. If courts stopped admitting it, they would do the research, right? Because they want it to be introduced at trial. Studies that have been done with human cadavers show that there's a lot of distortion when bite marks are made in skin, even in the laboratory setting. The same set of teeth will make marks of different sizes and shapes depending on the skin type, the amount of force, and the orientation of the bite. Missing teeth can look like they're there. Teeth that are there can look like they're missing. One study conducted by forensic dentists found an unsatisfactory level of agreement among examiners on whether a given injury was even a human bite mark. But during Simpson's trial, Dr. Johnson told the jury that there was no margin for error in this case. And then Stinson took the stand. He said he was at a party until about 1230, went home, and then later went back out to go to the store with a friend. He said as they walked behind his house, he heard footsteps and shushing coming from the back of the alley. But when Stinson first spoke to the police three days after the murder, he had only told them that he went home after the party and went to bed. As the prosecutor pointed out at the trial, he had changed his story. It's my experience that the jury looks a lot at those alibis and if somebody's lying for no other reason than perhaps trying to get out of something, that is pretty heavy evidence. After a three-day trial and less than two hours of deliberation, the jury found Stinson guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. On appeal, Stinson challenged the admissibility of the expert testimony in his trial, but the Wisconsin Court of Appeals affirmed his conviction. They were impressed by the dentist's elaborate methods. Dr. Dodson used an acrylic ring, three-dimensional indentation, 75 individual tooth marks. They actually claimed the reliability of the bite mark evidence in this case was sufficient to exclude to a moral certainty every reasonable hypothesis of innocence. It's so absurd. Tarot card readers have a very complex ancient methodology. It doesn't mean that they can tell your fortune. And with that ruling, Stinson became the precedent-setting case for bite mark evidence in Wisconsin. Seven years later, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision, the Daubert ruling, which should have changed the entire landscape for forensic science. It said that trial judges must assess whether expert testimony is based on reasoning or methodology that is scientifically valid. Daubert talks about reliability, validity, empirical data, error rates, peer review, it's all the good stuff. And scientists would look at it and feel their hearts would patter, they'd, they'd be cheered, because it says all the right words. But the problem is, it also says it's a flexible standard. The Daubert ruling gave judges a new gatekeeping role, but at the same time, it said that vigorous cross-examination and presentation of contrary evidence are still an appropriate means of attacking shaky but admissible evidence. So even though judges are supposed to evaluate expert testimony, they can still choose to offload that responsibility. They don't want to be responsible for letting the killer go free because they excluded the evidence. After all, the system has always relied on the attorneys to cross-examine witnesses they disagree with and present contrary evidence. You know, public defenders are by and large um, overwhelmed and often don't have the funding to hire their own independent experts, you know what I mean? But they shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to be defending against unreliable scientific evidence. And ultimately, it's up to the jury to decide what they believe. Yeah, I mean, the instructions are very clear that the jury does not have to give any further weight to an expert than any other witness, or kind of wait, they want to do the least totally after them. But the jury doesn't have basic information about the error rates of forensic methods like bite mark analysis. Those studies don't exist, in part because judges have never required them. 
I don't think there's evil intent anywhere in this circle. It's a collection mm -hmm. of institutional participants sometimes taking the easy way out. Nothing is suitable in our existing system for making the scientific determination that this evidence is questionable. And here's what juries and judges ought to know about it. It's not happening. As Robert Lee Stinson began his life sentence, the evidence in the case was boxed up and locked away. That included the blue pullover shirt the victim was wearing when she was killed. It was a crucial piece of evidence, but nobody knew that yet. And it would be 24 years before the true killer was found. Today's TMD board exclusive on Live at Six. He was locked up for 23 years. Bite mark analysis is now being questioned nationwide. They got a cold hit. That is, they weren't looking for anybody in particular. They just ran the profile through the database. And that's how your DNA just suddenly came up. All right. So, uh, you know, that, that I think illustrates well what some of the problems are in the way, way we use forensic evidence. Um, but it's also, it's a real problem for society. That case is a perfect example. The real killer of that poor woman um, was a serial killer and it went off because he was, he was not caught and somebody else was sitting in prison for him. He went off and, and killed multiple women thereafter. And so that's one of the problems you have with miscarriages of justice. Oftentimes it allows the real perpetrators to, to continue committing more crimes. All right, so Neil deGrasse Tyson sort of sums it up here. Um, we as a population are generally scientifically illiterate. And that's a, that's a real problem with this kind of evidence because we watch CSI and bones and all of those types of evidence that, that want to convince us that science can can prove it. So as as lawyers or as potential jurors, you should always assume nothing, question everything when you when you hear this kind of evidence. Um, it needs to be demystified. Uh, you know, Hollywood likes to tell us that there is a scientific test where you know they can determine exactly from this piece of little bit of dirt exactly where it came from uh, in the you know you know, in, at the crime scene and match it with something that's on the defendant's shoes, um, which isn't true. And, and that's just one example of, of all of these scientific tests that, by the way, can be done in an hour um, and all wrapped up and prove guilt or innocence one way or the other. Uh, forensic evidence is useful. It can be helpful, but it is not conclusive in most instances. Um, I just quickly uh, suggest if you haven't watched this, series on Netflix, How to Fix a Drug Scandal. It really illustrates one of the other problems with forensics science, the way it's too often used um, or uh, poorly supervised. In this instance, a, a, an analyst in Massachusetts who, who got away with thousands and thousands of cases over five or more years of uh, presenting false evidence. Um, and, in, and then in another instance, a, an analyst who had a drug problem was stealing the evidence and using it and then dry labbing, never testing it in the first place. Um, so crime lab cover-ups and fraud is unfortunately a problem all over and it really needs to be um, you know, tightly controlled by better supervised and better uh, funded uh, labs. Contamination of the evidence is true, especially with DNA. Um, it can occur either before or after the crime lab gets it. It can be accidental. So in a sexual assault case, a nurse takes swabs of the exterior and interior um, and in finding someone's DNA uh, on a cervical swab is pretty damning evidence that there was some sort of intercourse. Um, but in order to do that, the, the nurse has to be careful when she's swabbing not to touch the outside. And that sometimes um, doesn't occur the way it should. And so there's potential contamination that way. And there's the deliberate 
police planted kind of contamination, which was the, the defense that we had to use in Stephen Avery as we thought the evidence pointed that way. Um, police planted evidence is very difficult to, to prove from the defense standpoint. It's amazing that it's ever caught, but it is. Um, there's a case in Nebraska where a CSI director actually um, was caught planting blood in a trunk of a car, I think. Um, and he was ultimately charged, uh, prosecuted and convicted and went to prison. But that's the rare situation. Um, because contamination is difficult to detect in most instances. If you find a suspect's DNA in an evidence sample, you might think it's there because he uh, or she is the perpetrator, when in fact it might have been inadvertently there because of contamination. The only way you can really tell is if you find DNA in a blank control um, for which there should be, where there should be no human DNA at all, and then suddenly there is. That would be evidence. Lab management practices to prevent cognitive biases. This is an actual memo that we found in the Stephen Avery case that um, just a few days after the crime analyst, the crime lab received this evidence to test, uh, the chief investigator, one of them, uh, Detective Fassbender, called the analyst and told her to try to put her, the victim, in Stephen's house or garage. Uh, that kind of extraneous information has, has no place. Um, the, the kind of pressure that's on somebody to get a result, particularly in a high profile case, um, is just more than we can human, humanly expect they can resist. Flawed protocols. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you watch Making a Murder, you'll see this. Uh, uh, the, in our case, there was, a, there was blood of uh, Stephen Avery's found inside the victim's vehicle. And the question is, was it because the police could have planted it there to frame him? Like there, was a, there seemed to be some evidence pointing to. Um, and if so, where did it come from? How did they have access? Well, we found an actual vial of his blood in the clerk's office from his old case, his wrongful conviction. And it was unsecured. Um, police had easy access to it or law enforcement. Um, and so then the FBI was brought into this case, even though it wasn't a federal charge, federal crime. And they developed this protocol for the first time to determine um, whether or not this chemical preservative that's found in a blood vial called EDTA could be found in the stains that were inside the, the victim's vehicle. If so, then that would be an indication that somebody used that vial of blood to plant Stephen Avery's um, blood. On the other hand, if you don't find it in EDTA in those blood stains, then the assumption is that it must have been an actively bleeding uh, Stephen Avery and it wasn't planted evidence. The problem is this protocol was developed on the fly. It had never been used before. And what is it, 16 years later, it has never been used since. This was an unusual, the idea that the FBI on a, on a state crime, not even a federal crime, would create a whole uh, protocol to, to do a chemical test and use it only in his one case is just still boggles uh, my imagination. Um, and so it was being developed while the trial was going on and we didn't even get the results until the week before it was done. Uh, and then when we did, we discovered that one of the problems with it is that they had no known detection limit. So EDTA might've actually been present in those stains and, uh, that were found inside the vehicle, but just not be detected because this test was not sensitive enough to do it. And then we also discovered that the FBI analyst um, only tested three of six swabs and yet testified that even in the ones he didn't test, there was no EDTA. So that's the kind of, the kind of testimony that, that is sad that you ever hear in court. Another problem we see sometimes is work not done um, or withheld from the defense and the courts. Um, error rates, deviations from protocols, failure to preserve samples, uh, misleading final reports. Um, and, and in particular with pattern matching testimony, uh, 
this sub, which is really subjective, uh, for which there's no database. And this, I'm using an, an example here of, of um, toolmark ballistics type testimony, where um, these analysts, you know, it, again, it's a double field microscope. One one has a, a test fired bullet from the gun that's recovered, and the other is a, a bullet or shell that's found at the crime scene. And then they they give an opinion about whether it's um, a match in their in their estimation, and um, they generally don't like to bring in the photographs that they take of it because you know jurors can see these mat these lines don't match up in lots of different areas. Um, but they nevertheless, in this particular case, testified that it came from this gun and no other gun in the world. Overstated opinions to the exclusion of all others. Um, and one of my favorite is this. The non -rep when, when you cross-examine certain experts and they admit that their test wasn't replicated and that in fact nobody can replicate it, um, it's, it's not a flaw in the process. It's like a badge of honor that you're supposed to accept my opinion because I have this special skill and all my years of experience and of course, which a jury has no way of, of uh, challenging. All right, now back to the Ralph Armstrong case and, and we'll wrap up shortly. So there was in, incorrect witness identification. As I showed you from that lineup photo, it was a deliberately biased and suggestive lineup that would clearly point to one person, the defendant. Uh, the DA and the police just assumed he was guilty and they used microscopic hair comparison evidence, which was presented to the jury. It was two head hairs that were found on the bathrobe belt draped across the victim's back. So the belt is clearly placed there by the killer. And there's two head hairs. And they look at that and they, it was misused at trial. And the, in the closing argument that the prosecutor says, those are Ralph Armstrong's hairs on that belt. And it ties him irrevocably to this scene. And there's no explanation for it, those, his hairs being on that belt other than the fact he's the killer. Well, DNA tests, as you can probably see already here on the slide, later excluded Ralph from those hairs. And ultimately that resulted in the Wisconsin Supreme Court reversing his um, conviction, ordering a new trial. And the state then said, well, before that, we wanna do more DNA tests on the crime scene evidence, for which they came up with 60 additional exclusions of Ralph. And also discovered with better technology over the years, a new semen stain that had not been noticed before on the bathrobe belt that excluded Ralph Armstrong and showed a partial suspect profile of somebody else. So did the DA dismiss the case? You might think so, but no. Instead, this DA, had, there was a court order in place that said he's not to touch any of the evidence without notice to the defense first. He violated that court order. He sent it back to the crime lab, had them test that semen stain that was potentially exculpatory evidence pointing to the real perpetrator, destroyed it. And it was therefore unavailable. Um, it later came out that this same DA had been contacted 15 years earlier by uh, after the conviction, 14 years after he was convicted, by a witness who said that this other person had confessed that he, not Ralph Armstrong, was the killer. And that was suppressed. There was no report written. Courts weren't told. Defense wasn't told. It came out really serendipitously to me. Um, as a result of which, the DA, or I'm sorry, the judge dismissed the case himself as a violation of uh, the defendant's constitutional rights and outrageous government misconduct. Now, the, the, the epilogue to this is that this DA was a, was a nice guy, a reasonable DA in, in all other cases. Um, not like a certain unknown or unnamed DA that what you'll see in making a murderer uh, who he and I never got along with. Um, the DA in Ralph's case was, was really a reasonable guy who got carried away because he would not accept the fact that he had prosecuted and convicted the wrong guy and had told the victim's parents 
They didn't want to have to go to the victim's parents and say, sorry, the killer of your daughter was went free. Um, and that kind of, it's a human pressure that we all, uh, it's understandable, but good prosecutors need to set that aside and do what's just. As a result, this is Ralph in 1981. He spent 29 years in prison. He later sued, but lawsuits for wrongful convictions in America are very hard. And he ultimately got one and a half million dollars for 29 years of his life being deprived. All right, I'm gonna wrap up here. We have a little bit of time for some questions, I think. Uh, you can also, these are all the different ways you can reach me if you've got other specific questions, I'll do my best to try and answer them. Um, you, you can find me on Twitter, email me. I'll leave this slide up for a bit. And I'll turn it over to John then to uh, see if he can pull up any questions that there might be. That sounds absolutely great, fantastic. Okay, I'm just going to uh, reclaim the host to allow me to do that. And uh, fantastic. Can I abuse my privilege for a second and ask you one of my own? Um, so you uh, you ended by talking about the the motivations of various different district attorneys and 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 whether they were nice guys or not and things like that. And what I was curious about was what do you think in terms of the scientific experts that you have encountered or that you you're speaking about more abstractly? What's their motivation for behaving in the way that they they do? Is it is it hubris? Are they falling foul of the sort of presumption of guilt that sometimes people can can buy into if someone's charged with a crime? What is it that leads these people to behave in a way that's kind of counterintuitive to the justice system? You know, I've seen both. I've seen a lot of hubris, uh, particularly with the, the older um, uh, crime lab analysts who, uh, you know, who have been doing it their way for 25, 30 years. And uh, trust me, I know what's right. I know, how, I know what I'm doing. Um, they tend to, tend to have some hubris and, um, you know, it's in, in 95% or 99% of the time, they're not deliberately falsifying their testimony. They're not lying to convict an innocent man or person. Um, they, but they fall into this cognitive bias category where they believe that the person the, sus the police have arrested and pointed to is guilty and they are um, unconsciously feeling pressure to help um, do something through their test and their testimony to help the conviction, to, to not let the guilty guy go free. That's, I think, the, the, the bigger problem. And then there, but there is that class of people who are absolutely fraudulent, who deliberately plant evidence or deliberately dry lab, um, where they, they say they did tests and they issue report, reports. And in fact, they never tested it at all. That's what you see in that Netflix "How to Fix a Drug Case" um, documentary. I think dry lab is such a sort of romantic term for a really unpleasant thing. Really, it's it's it makes it sound scientific when in actuality there's no science to it of of any kind. I was thinking about I'd never heard it said before, but you spoke about the lack of replication and, and it being a badge of honor. My own background is is kind of biochemistry and and things like that. And I was thinking about all the times that I've had some rubbish data that I've generated that is really just a, a result of my own ineptitude and how much nicer it would be if I could say it, it's just my specialist skill set. No one else can replicate these numbers. It's uh, it's um, it, it's confined to just me. It's so unscientific as a as a way of doing things. And we've got a couple of questions that have come into the chat that I'll put yeah, to let you. Me, let me let me just add one thing. I, I, I yeah, do sure. a lot. Of, I do a lot of talks to forensic science groups and. Um, forensic science students. And I, I, I find generally that the younger people entering the field these days, they really want to do good science. They wanna do right. And um, uh, the problem sometimes is the pressures when they then, if they get into a lab and they're sort of on the job trained by these dinosaurs, I call them, who um, really aren't into good science. So you know we need to really support um, young people who want to go into this field is very important. And, uh, you know, I think most of them do want to try and do a good job. Yeah. I, when I was um, starting at a university, there was a, a phenomenon called the CSI effect. And it was the fact that the forensic courses were seeing a lot of applicants coming in because they had watched TV shows of that kind and, and they, they had been inspired to, to join. But I'm, I'm sure you're right. A lot of them probably want to 
to do good work and reverse some of the trends that we've that we've seen. Um, one of the questions in the chat is, uh, given your expertise in forensics and things of that nature, do you have any thoughts on the role that AI might come to play in some of that sort of some of that sort of work? You know, that's it's interesting because um, uh, forensic science evidence is is not going away. It's not it's not becoming less it's becoming more in court and you find it in in technological advances. So digital forensic evidence is huge these days in in so many cases, everything from um, cell tower triangulation to GPS to um, you know, analysis of computers, phones, and data, and all of that, cloud data. Um, and, but, and now also algorithms. Um, the problem is you don't know what the, the scientific uh, basis of those algorithms are. So there are algorithms that help try and um, separate these complex mixtures of DNA. But uh, for many years, the, there was only one, that, or primarily one, and it was proprietary. And they would not release their underlying data to show how they, um, how they, the algorithm worked. And um, uh, you also find it, you know, there's a lot of bias in AI and in the use of algorithms because it's kind of baked in if there are uh, racial or um, ethnic kinds of biases of the people that enter the data, um, it can be baked in. Now, AI is, is still so new that it's hard to say. Um, you know, many people have found flaws in it and whether it ultimately can help, it might with some very complex uh, questions in particular, but we'll have to see. The real thing we've gotta be careful of is courts have to be gatekeepers and have to not just allow any kind of AI or you know algorithmic based evidence in without you know uh, some sort of pretrial um, hearings to make sure it's truly reliable at least reliable because jurors really don't have the you, you can't case by case by case educate jurors enough to make uh, the right decision and so they really should not be presented with junk science it should be at least reliable, and then they can decide whether to accept it as being um, enough to convict or acquit. Just quickly, you say that um, that jurors don't have that skill set, and I can completely see why you say that. Do you think that also applies in the whole to judges as well? Absolutely. I mean, very, very few judges. I mean, judges are former; they're lawyers who became judges, and um, you know, it used to be all joke that. that you know, those of us who go to law school, we went to law school because we're terrible at math and science. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have always had an interest in science, but uh, most of my lawyer colleagues do not. And so um, that is a problem when, uh, you know, it's sort of the blind leading the blind. Um, you know, we need better independent expert witnesses to come in and help educate judges as well and train them maybe some more people who go down the same sort of path as you, because your first degree was in forensic science, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Could we trouble you with just one or two more? Is that okay? Sure, sure. Uh, so you gave some examples of some uh, forensic disciplines that aren't really considered credible anymore. And someone's asking whether or not you think that forensic psychiatry is one that belongs on that list as well. You know, that's interesting. So forensic psychiatry, is, it's what we call soft science. Um, it's... Uh, it's always been subjective, of course, and it's always based upon the, the ability of the psychiatrist to come to a valid conclusion. Now, there are lots of psychological instruments that are used in the process, um, some of them very, very good, that have in fact undergone rigorous scientific validation, replication, error rates. Um, some of them uh, can pick out, um, malingers. Um, they have sort of latent um, questions that, that aren't at the conscious level of the, 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 the person who's being evaluated. So they can't, they don't even know whether they're, they're going to um, be detected, you know, faking it or not. Um, so, but still it is a, you know, it, it's still a subjective opinion of is it's not just the psychological test, it's the clinical interview that the psychologist or the psychiatrist 
does with the subject. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's been admissible for many, many, many years, decades. Uh, and jurors, at least with that kind of evidence, are a little more, have a little more healthy skepticism, I think. Um, they're, they're willing to, to really put uh, the expert's testimony to the test rather than just accept it as something that they saw on CSI and, and therefore must be true. I'll pull just one more if that's okay and then we can wind up from from there so uh, someone's asking whether or not you think that it's the science that's really in need of reform here or whether or not the the legal system is potentially just unwilling to accept when there have been mistakes it's really more of the latter um, because I mean there is junk science that's that people still peddle like snake oil um but it is really the courts. It's the responsibility of the courts um, and the whole legal system. So including those who fund the legal system to, uh, you know, to adequately allow judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, the resources to be able to test these so-called scientists and see whether their uh, opinions and their testimony should be admissible or should be allowed at all. Um, it is a system-wide failure. It's not, uh, and like I said, good science, real science is constantly evolving. Things that we, we believe were true 10, 20 years ago uh, that science has now disproven, they move on with it. It's accepted, it's wrong, it, but the law is so slow to do that. Um, the only institution that's maybe slower is the Vatican um, that could take centuries to, uh, to change things, but uh, there's too much reliance on precedence. Uh, the, that's why that, that example in the, the video of bite mark evidence is so good. And let me just make one clarification on that too, I meant to say, um, bite mark evidence is different than odontology. Odontology um, is where, where dentists, uh, experts are able to match teeth with x-rays and make those kinds of identifications. Nobody's ever really questioned that. It's the bite marks where, you know, somebody, somebody bites or the, you know, a, a pliable skin on a suspect or a victim and that kind of ability to distinguish uh, with any kind of degree of certainty is, is what's been challenged and what's really junk science in my opinion. If I just maybe squish in one last one on my own. So you and I had some coffee together about four years ago when you came to Edinburgh and I hope maybe we can do it again sometime as well. I was sure. there because this book had just been launched and it was really interesting and I'd just read it. Um, I, I had thought that by now I might have seen a second one come out possibly or maybe something something else. Is, is there a chance that there's another book that might come out? In the uh, future? I, I hope so. Yeah, there's still plenty. So the book you're referring to is, is Illusion of Justice and um, it was on my last slide, but you, you can... Uh, you can find it easily enough. There was a question I saw here about the name of the case I was talking about, Ralph Armstrong. It, I talk about it in my book quite a bit because uh, I was working, so he spent 29 years in prison. I was working on that case for 15 of those 29 years. It's, it's insane that it takes that long to get justice after there's been a conviction. Um, and that's true all over the world. I mean, it is very difficult you have a miscarriage of justice commission in the UK, but it's very slow. There's a lot of criticisms of because of that. And um, some places you can't even get back to court. One, one, at least one thing in America, you can, you can file motions many years later if there's newly discovered evidence. Some places it's very difficult. Um, so, uh, but at any rate, I talk about the Ralph Armstrong case in large part because it was going on at the same time as the Avery case. And in fact, I got a big tip that broke open the Armstrong case because I was, somebody saw me, uh, the, the Avery case was huge, hugely um, uh, publicized even then, long before making a murder. And I don't know, there was something like one TV net, uh, station and 25,000 viewers a day or something. And I got a tip from somebody, I'm not, it's in the book, you can read, read about it, but I got a tip from somebody in Texas who had watched 
saw me online and said, hey, you're also on Ralph Armstrong's case, I see it. So um, the, the book is partly about making a murderer. It's partly a memoir, making a criminal defense attorney, why we do what we do. And I use a number of my cases, many more than that, to illustrate what I think are some of the flaws in our justice system and make some suggestions on what we can do to improve it. And another book should be coming out at some point, but it's, it's hard to find the time. Well, if and when that happens, I'm sure someone, it won't be me anymore, but someone would probably love to have you back, I imagine, because the, the comment section is filling up people saying that they really appreciate your time tonight, and I certainly appreciate it too. So thank you so much for joining us. That was really interesting. You're very welcome. Have a good night.